Welcome to Bible 360, 2 Peter. Peter probably wrote this letter from Rome shortly before his execution by Emperor Nero. Because Peter cannot physically visit these churches in person, he wants to make sure that he's absolutely clear about a few very important points. In other words, Peter is even more blunt and unapologetic than normal. Since Peter can't straighten out false teachers in person, he does so forcefully through this letter. One of Peter's main concerns is the integrity of the church in his absence. So he get, begins by explaining and defending the gospel in chapter 1. He attacks and dismantles false teachings and shady scoundrels in chapter 2. And he reinforces that Christ will indeed return to condemn wickedness and redeem God's people in chapter 3. Peter knows he will soon be taken from them. So he reminds them that he's not just a teacher or a preacher, but actually an eyewitness and apostle of Jesus who told Peter to take care of his sheep. Peter saw firsthand Jesus' suffering, but also him glorified, transfigured, and ascending into heaven. His interactions and memories of Jesus are not only valuable, but exactly what has made him so resolute in his faith. Remember, in the courtyard of the high priest, Peter had denied Christ three times to save his own skin. Well, now he faces Rome with confidence in God's power and plan to save through the resurrection of Jesus. Even from the beginning of Peter's interactions with Jesus, he displayed faith. However, his faith changed greatly over time. After being humbled, corrected, and making numerous mistakes along the way, Peter has a more mature and appreciative understanding of Jesus and God's kingdom. He wants Christians, likewise, to deepen and develop their faith. He knows what it is to be corrected and made the better for it. So in chapter 2, he shows little hesitation in rebuking and teaching. And Peter shows no sympathy for false teachers. He vociferously rebukes false teachings, much as Jesus had once rebuked Peter for his satanic statements. Peter still has the same goals that he did in 1 Peter. He wants Christians to mature and to lead virtuous lives as witness. This happens when they exercise self-control. They must watch themselves and be steadfast even in the face of persecution. They must remain loyal to Jesus even when others try to attract or distract them away from Jesus' hard but good message of suffering and forgiveness. He wants them to grow more and more in their affection for one another. This is not book learning, but character development. It's not just doctrine, it's discipleship. He doesn't want them to forget that they have been cleansed by falling back into filthy living because faithful trees bear good fruit. One way to make sure good trees grow well is to make sure they are firmly planted. So Peter defends the message of the gospel, not only by his own eyewitness, but by the testimony of the Old Testament scriptures. These are not simply human works, but the inspired word of God. Peter recalls the father saying, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. The father says, Jesus is my boy. He's doing exactly what I want, so follow him. The other way to help good trees bear good fruit is by rooting out the weeds or anything that damages or threatens the tree. And that's exactly what Peter does in chapter two when he accuses some of the teachers of being false and tricksy. Teachers that are greedy, who are encouraging, giving in to your sensual desires, they're looking to exploit you. To drive home his point, Peter brings up some of his most pointed and frightening bad examples in the scriptures. The people destroyed by the flood and Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed by fire. He also brings up the popular Jewish story, First Enoch, where angels begin sleeping around with women and are punished. If even angels, nations, and all of civilization can be punished for leaving, living greedy and sexually out of control lives, what makes these leaders think that Christians can get away with it? These false teachers sound bold and daring, but they're actually rebellious and blasphemous. Peter harps on how these leaders are more like animals than the children of God. They have less sense than jackasses, like the one that had to reprimand Balaam in the book of Numbers. They promise freedom, but are slaves to their lusts and desires, like dogs returning to their own vomit. Peter warns his readers that Jesus dealt with scoffers and mockers, so don't be surprised that you have to deal with more of the same. There is, though, an expiration date on this world, and everyone will one day have to give an account for their life before God. It's exactly because of corruption in this world that it must end, so God may make it a right anew. So don't fit in with a decaying world. Act like those who truly live. While these false teachers give license to people to give in to their impulses and live for the now, Peter preaches patience. Just like the prophets waited eagerly for the coming of Christ, we now wait eagerly for the return of Christ. Like Jesus suffering but enduring and trusting God's plan, we should be patient. 
It may feel like suffering or waiting has been going on for a long time, but God's plan and perspective are bigger. His plan of salvation is more expansive than our tiny life or attention spans can fully appreciate. The example of the prophets encourages us as they spoke of God's future promises that Peter saw fulfilled firsthand in Christ. Even though the world is self-assured and indifferent to God's call, so too were those in Noah's day. God's judgment have never been predicted or anticipated by the world, which is committed to living to please themselves. God comes rather like a thief in the night. Armed with this knowledge, we should be on our guard against living as if right and wrong are unimportant. Life matters. How we live and what we do matters. They matter because we have been called by our Savior to be good and faithful people. As Peter says several times, we should make every effort to live in a way that is consistent with being called by Jesus, who came to bring about and bring us into God's good and eternal way of living.